Good evening again. Welcome to another convocation of our current series. It is always a pleasure to welcome well-known personalities to campus. Tonight, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing a man who is internationally known. Before I do, however, permit me a slight digression. Approximately two years ago, at a dinner sponsored by the History Department here at Ball State, I had the pleasure of introducing world-renowned advocate of world peace, Sir Norman Avery. Despite his physical infirmity, this 93-year-old man made an impassioned plea for peace, the likes of which I have never heard. Truly an incredible performance for a man of his age. Shortly after his death two years ago, arrangements were made for Ball State to acquire his papers and books. Beginning with the preliminary negotiations for this valuable collection eight years ago, and culminating with his visit to our campus, the name Sir Norman Angel had almost become a household word in the history department. So much, in fact, that I almost automatically applied the title Sir whenever I saw the name Norman. I mention these circumstances tonight for two purposes. First, that during this brief introduction, I should make a slip and refer to our guest as Sir Norman Cousins, I'm sure you will understand. And secondly, and more important, there is an interesting parallel between the sense of dedication of both Normans that they have had in their advocacy of world peace. In his book, The Great Illusion, Sir Norman Angel delineated the futility of war and expressed the desirability of peace. Norman Cousins, in his speeches, editorials, and books, also has stressed the futility of war and has emphasized the absolute necessity of peace. Mr. Cousins is no stranger to the Ball State campus, having appeared here twice before on Convo's uh, presentation. By way of historical or biographical information, I should point out that following his graduation from Columbia University in 1944, he served as an able reporter for New York newspapers. In 1944, he in 40 he graduated. In 1944, he assumed the editorship of a magazine which is now known as the Saturday Review. The fantastic rise and success of this periodical can be attributed largely to his work, especially the quality of his editorial, which have earned for him the enviable reputation of being one of the most influential voices in American journalism. More than any living American, he has fostered the idea that the approach to world problems should be based on human interests, not national interests. It is worth noting that Mr. Cousins practices what he preaches. In addition to presenting his views through various media, he underlines his belief through practical application. His efforts on behalf of the victims of Hiroshima, for example, show how he has applied in practice that which he advocates in theory. Time does not allow an enumeration of the many organizations of which our speaker is a member, an officer, or a consultant. Suffice it to say that he belongs to a host of organizations whose aims are directed towards education, democratic action, and world peace. Equally numerous are the awards he has received, including 18 honorary degrees from American colleges and universities in humane letters, literature, and law. 
Mr. Cousin stands out as a man whose keen intelligence is exceeded only by his noble ideas and remarkable courage. Ladies and gentlemen, it is a real privilege to present Mr. Cousin, who will speak on the subject, World Report. Okay. Dr. Kaldemeyer, ladies and gentlemen, what I feared was not that I might be called Sir Norman, but the late Sir Norman. I, I'd like to apologize for my lateness. We uh, arrived at the Indianapolis airport on time, but the car broke down between Indianapolis and Muncie, a fan belt with a generator out, out in the uh, uh, dark fastnesses, but I must say that the experience was not nearly so disquieting as it was in Kansas City some years ago, when uh, just about this time of the year, uh, in a cold rain, a slashing rain, I was driven to the Kansas City Forum, the auditorium, and it turned out to be not just one auditorium, but a combination of auditoriums, convention halls, exhibition halls and price fight arenas. I uh, was directed to the auditorium on the third floor. I had to go through an elevator. I identified myself, went up the elevator, went to the auditorium, and then noticed that there were no steps leading to the platform. I asked the gentleman how you got backstage, and he said, uh, just go through that exit door and bear to your left. I opened the door and something told me to check to make sure it was not bolted from the inside. I swung around, it closed, I couldn't get it in time, it was bolted from the inside. There was no passageway to the left, something I should have realized about Kansas City in the first place. <laughs> Instead, there was just a, a stairwell in front of me going straight down to, well, wherever stairways go straight down to in Kansas City. I rapped on the door behind me. It had a steel thickness, apparently, of several inches, and that was unavailing. And I had nothing to do except to make the great descent. I got to the bottom and uh, did as directed, and I got lost in the catacombs of Kansas City among stage sets from 1896 to 1997, Lee Lynn, for example, I looked at the luminous dial on my watch and saw that I was due in two or three minutes, and I spied a line of light on the floor, and I thought that it might be under a door. I groped my way to it. The door had a handle. The handle turned and the door opened, and I found myself on the platform of a poultry convention. Brilliantly lighted, being addressed at that precise moment by the late H.V. Uh, Kaltenborn, who, when he heard the audience gasp as they saw me projected from these nether depths, spun around, looked at me, and I smiled as wanly as I could under the circumstances and told him I would explain it some future date, which I did, and backed out, and there I was once again in the catacombs of Kansas City. Well, eventually I found a, an exit door with a bar handle on it, and I pushed pushed it, it opened, and there I was on the street, three blocks from the entrance to the auditorium. I checked my hat and coat, it was raining. Uh, I didn't want to go back to the catacombs, and so I made a run for it. And I must say that the suit was not quite the same when I came through the front door. Uh, and I started to go through the elevator, and the gentleman asked me for my ticket. And I said, I realize that I don't look much like it at this point, perhaps at any point, but sir, I happen to be the speaker. He looked at me and he said, oh yeah, bud? <laughs> I said, well, I, I think I can prove that I'm the speaker. But he said, you can't prove nothing. The speaker went upstairs 20 minutes ago. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a, a certain impenetrable quality to his logic. I said, well, seriously, how do I get in? He said, you buy your ticket the same as everyone else. Well, up to this point, I was disposed to accept the incident in good grace, 
but now for the first time it had a penalty attached to it. But I decided that I would buy a ticket because I reflected that this country would have far better lectures if the lecturers occasionally had to pay their way in to hear themselves. <laughs> but I must say I was outraged when I discovered that they were charging a dollar and seventy-five cents to hear a lecture I'd heard before. <laughs> Seriously, on the way from the student center where I was dropped off in the in the S in the police car escort, uh, I got some news from the from the policeman who was driving. Uh, you see, I've been incommunicado since I got on the plane at about uh, three o'clock today. And I asked him if there was any news about the Pueblo, and he told me that the, the president had declared that he was going to have a bombing pause. Is this correct? Did anyone hear the news? That there would be an unconditional bombing pause? Um, uh, if so, I'd, uh, I, I assume that this is what the statement is, and I, with you I rejoice if that is the fact. Because it seems to me that the essential question is not so much whether, the, whether there should be total war or total withdrawal in Vietnam as whether we can get into a political settlement to end the war. Now there will be no peace in Vietnam and we will not end the war in Vietnam by thinking that we can win in Vietnam. All this does is to set the stage for an even larger struggle more men and then what are we faced with the need for three million men four million men five million men ten million men on the mainland of asia with a nuclear war this is the prospect of unlimited escalation because you can be sure that communist china is committed to preventing the overthrow of north vietnam just as much as we are committed to preventing the overthrow of south vietnam well, if we can end the war through unlimited escalation, can we end it through total and unilateral withdrawal? There doesn't seem to be much, much prospect that the war could end in that way. We might withdraw, but the war would go on. And if all the reports are correct, there could be a period of ghastly bloodletting in South Vietnam. And so just as it's unrealistic to talk about total escalation as a way of ending the war, so it seems to me to be unrealistic to talk about total withdrawal as a way of ending the war because the United States is not going to do it. What does this leave? It leaves only the prospect of ending it through a settlement, ending it at the peace table, ending it through negotiation. Now so far, it seems to me that the stated aims of the United States government in this, in this respect merit support, which is to pursue through all means an opportunity for serious negotiations looking to the end of the war. That policy, I say, I believe commands the support of most Americans. However, we have some serious questions, which is which bear, these questions bear on a larger question, namely, is the stated policy the real policy? I confess there are serious questions in my mind whether the stated policy is the real policy, and I should like, if I may, to state the reason. First, on September the 14th of 1966, Two envoys, or rather the National Liberation Front in South Vietnam, communicated with Yu Thant, the Secretary General of the United Nations, and the message was that the National Liberation Front would like to send two envoys to the United Nations. Yu Thant, reading this, concluded that this would have something to do with exploratory talks to set the stage for negotiations. It was a reasonable deduction. The message that came from the National Liberation Front said, of course, we assume that you will arrange 
with the State Department for visas so that we can have entree to the United States, to the United Nations. Youth aren't communicated with the State Department and waited for an answer. After a number of days, he didn't receive the authorization for the visas, this being United Nations business. Instead, he received a long series of questions, to which, obviously, he didn't have the answer. Who are the men? What do they want? How long will they stay? Uh, what is their official business, etc.? Now, the question is whether this is pro these were quite properly questions which should be raised by the United States to what can legitimately considered United Nations business. And by the time Yusan got the reply back from the State Department and sent the message through to uh, Hanoi, uh, the, uh, that particular prospect had vanished. All right, we go back one year before that, almost a year before that, uh, which would be on January the 4th, 1966. On January the 4th, the Foreign Secretary, the Deputy Foreign Secretary Call of India in New Delhi, sent a message to the United States conveying an answer from North Vietnam to the question asked by Secretary Rusk. Namely, if we stop the bombing, if the United States stops the bombing, what is North Vietnam prepared to do with its half of the war? What will they do? What will they stop? It was a, an entirely reasonable question that the Secretary had asked. Obviously, you can't go at this unilaterally. The answer that came back by way of India was that Hanoi would be prepared to cease hostilities altogether if the United States stopped the bombing. The second major point made in the, in the message we got from India was that Hanoi proposed that the Buddhist holiday of Tet, which is just... Uh, as you know, uh, a current, that the Buddhist holiday of Tet become the occasion for the end of the bombing and indeed for a ceasefire altogether. And that the ceasefire could be maintained in order to create the opportunity for negotiations. Sometime later, some ten days later, if my information is correct, either a week or Ten days later, we sent back, the United States sent back a query. The uh, question put to us was clear enough. We could answer yes or no. Would we agree to a ceasefire at the time of Tet? Uh, would we accept a total ceasefire in exchange for, for a cessation of bombing? Was this, was this uh, a legitimate answer? Instead of which, we sent back a query asking for clarification. And by that time, once again, uh, uh, by the time we sent the message, the, uh, the offer was dead. Now we go back, as I say, that, the, the correct date of that message to the United States, I may have I've been ahead of myself, the correct message of that, date of that message was January the 4th, 1967, exactly one year ago. Now we go back to the a few months earlier, on November the 14th, 1966, Ambassador Lodge spoke to the Polish ambassador, the representative to the International Control Commission, the ICC, created by Geneva, and asked Mr. Lewandowski if Poland would use its good offices with Hanoi in an attempt to bring about negotiations and whether he would convey to Hanoi the bona fides of the United States in seeking negotiations. This was necessary because we knew that Hanoi feared that the United States 
would interpret its willingness to, go, to negotiate as weakness, and that, and that would also assume that the United States had no desire to negotiate, but was actually probing for weakness, after which the United States would walk away from negotiations. And so it became necessary to bear witness to the good faith of the United States in seeking negotiations. Ambassador Lewandowski took the ICC plane that plies between Saigon and Hanoi. Even all during the war, you, there's been a plane service between uh, Saigon and Hanoi. It stopped at Vien Chien, Laos, and had a week's conversation with Ho Chi Minh, who at first said that he could not agree to any negotiations unless the United States unconditionally ceased bombing. The point that Lewandowski made was that the United States would stop its bombing once there was an agreement to negotiate. Therefore, why lose lives and why bother about what comes first? If they would remove their condition, their demand for cessation of bombing, the United States would have the cessation by itself. It didn't have to be agreed to. In any event, the important thing was to agree to negotiations and to set up the machinery for negotiations. Finally, Ho Chi Minh agreed that he would enter into exploratory talks with the United States without any condition with respect to a cessation of bombing. The exploratory talks would be carried out in Warsaw. Ho Chi Minh explained that he was very apprehensive about having negotiations anywhere near the war theater because you see, he has his own hawks, uh, his own hardliners, who have been telling him that, he, that uh, in dealing with the United States, he's dealing with tricksters, and that uh, this would be an act of weakness on his part, and therefore there will be no negotiations. And so he had told Lewandowski that if any report of, Le of negotiations got out, he would be forced to deny it and wanted the exploratory talks to be held at some distant place, in secret. Lewandowski, elated, returned to Saigon on November the 29th, and was able to convey to Ambassador Lodge the good news. They met at the home of the Italian ambassador, he was able to convey to Ambassador Lodge the good news that, the, that Hanoi was prepared to accept the bona fides of the United States and agreed to exploratory talks that would start in Warsaw on December the 15th. Two days later, Hanoi was bombed for the first time. After the United States had said it had no intention of bombing Hanoi, Lewandowski came back to Lodz and he said, we feel imposed upon. You have just asked us to bear witness to your bona fides. If you had told us that as soon as you got word that they would be willing to talk, that you would then step up the war and bomb Hanoi, we would not have gone up to Hanoi to present the case for you. Ambassador Lodge said that the bombing was dreadful, a dreadful error, and that the order for the bombing had gone out some days earlier and through some dreadful circumstance had not been canceled. But he begged Lewandowski not to allow a mistake to get in the way of something infinitely more important, the ending of the war. Could he please try to persuade Hanoi to put the negotiations back on the track. Lewandowski had further conversations and was able to inform the United States government that the negotiations could proceed on December the 15th in Warsaw as planned. On December 13th and 14th, Hanoi was bombed again, and that was the end of the negotiations. Incident number three. In January, 
1966. I went to the Far East with Vice President Humphrey at the request of President Johnson. I went as presidential ambassador to the inauguration of President Marcus of the Philippines. One of the things we were asked to do while we were in the Far East was to probe for the possibility of negotiations. We came back, reported to the President that nothing of considerable substance had transpired, although I reported that I had met a Japanese member of Parliament, a Christian minister, who had been to Cambodia and North Vietnam, had spoken to Sipanuk and also Ho Chi Minh, and had conveyed to Ho Chi Minh the Prince's proposal that the only way to end the war would be through a neutralization of Cambodia, Laos, and South Vietnam. And Ho Chi Minh said, I think that that would be a good way of ending it, but I think you should also include the neutralization of North Vietnam. A very clear indication that they feared communist China and didn't want to become dependent on communist China. Want neutralization against everyone with guarantees of neutralization. But there's no hard information we had about uh, negotiations, and the President asked us to continue to try to get through and to persuade Hanoi that there were no tricks up the American sleeve and that we genuinely wanted negotiations. Sometime later, I was able to make contact with the Poles at the United Nations and proposed to them that an American be put in touch with a representative from North Vietnam so that he might testify to the good faith of President Johnson. I reported on my conversation with the President and representatives of the administration, which at that time left no doubt in my mind that the administration genuinely wanted to negotiate. The Polish ambassador said that he would communicate this information to his government, to the foreign minister. And several days later, I received word that they would be willing, North Vietnam would be willing to receive an American who was in that position to testify to the good faith of the government, a private American. But this would have to be done in some other capital other than Hanoi. Warsaw or, or some other place. It was decided that such a place would be Warsaw. Our government, however, felt that this was during the, pause, the extended pause in the bombing. Our government felt that since this was during the pause that the president might be vibrated and it wanted a higher indication of a desire to talk. This was conveyed back to Hanoi and Hanoi notified us that the reply that we sought would be forthcoming in a special letter being sent by Ho Chi Minh to Prime Minister Shastri of India that Saturday, which I believe was January the 24th, 1966. And our attention was called in advance to the last five paragraphs of the letter as being responsive to the request of the State Department. The next day we received an advanced copy of the talk. When I saw it, I realized that it would not be satisfactory because the five points of the last five paragraphs were preceded by the sentence saying, the United States must accept the following as a basis for negotiations. Well, you can't go into negotiations with someone saying to you, you must accept, because you're not dealing with negotiations. You're going into an ultimatum situation. And the moment I saw that particular sentence, I realized that the, that the five points, no matter what they said, would be unacceptable. But let it be said that the five points 
were far more flexible than the previous four points of Vietnam, North Vietnam had been on the subject of ending the war and, and negotiations. But good though those five points were, comparatively, they were negated by the introduction which said the United States must accept the following as a basis for negotiations. Consequently, I was not surprised the next day uh, when the United States uh, sent back the message that uh, this was not acceptable. We were not going to, into negotiations with anything saying we must accept. We were making no such hard and fast conditions. I relayed the, the information, and late that night, I was awakened and received a report that the letter had been mistranslated, that Ho Chi Minh had written, had used the verb Dwarekanetra, and that had been, and that Dwarekanetra had been translated into must accept. Well, Dwa could be translated as must, and Rekanetra could be translated as accept, but more accurately, Dwa could be translated as should or ought, and Rekanetra could be translated as recognize or consider. What, therefore, did Ho Chi Minh mean? What did he have in mind? Now the clarification came that he had written, the United States ought to consider the following as the basis for negotiation. And so now suddenly, there's an entirely new face on the matter. Again, this was conveyed to our government, but I was told that it was no use, that we had decided to resume the bombing. It didn't seem to me that this, this seemed to me inconceivable. The bombing had not yet resumed. What the president said he thought now existed. The president, president wanted some indication, however slight, of a desire to negotiate. It came at the last minute. Since the bombing had not been resumed, and since we had the indication that we sought, why at least could we not have postponed the resumption to have tested it? If it developed on investigation that there was no substance to this particular message, we could have then made the decision to take whatever appropriate measures we wished. But to proceed with the resumption of the bombing, despite the very real evidence we had that there might be something, without even testing it, as I said, seemed to me to be inconceivable, to put it, put it mildly, because what it meant was that months or a year or more, or years would pass, during which no one would know how many people were killed, Vietnamese and Americans, how many villages would be destroyed. The next morning the bombing was resumed, and the President said that there had been no indication of any desire to explore the possibility of negotiations. I'll now give you another incident. In November a year ago, the President of the United States with Secretary Rust and Ambassador Goldberg <coughs> went to the United Nations to persuade Yuthant to accept re-election as Secretary General. Yuthant said that he had valued the office and was privileged to have served, but did not feel that his office had been, been particularly useful in helping to bring about an end to the war in Vietnam. The purpose of the United Nations was to bring about peace, to maintain peace. The war in Vietnam had, been gone, had gone on for years. It was, it was expanding. More and more people were being killed. And he confessed a sense of his own failure. The president then said that he hoped that Yusant would stay on because he felt that Yusant could be useful in bringing about negotiations. In that case, said Yusant, Mr. President, why didn't you accept the opportunity to negotiate when I, Yusant, had arranged it? 
the president said he knew of no such opportunity. And Yusan said that in August 1964, after the president had made a speech declaring our limit aim, limited aims in Vietnam, that what we saw was a chance for self-determination of the v Vietnamese people. We wanted to produce stability in Vietnam. We wanted to use our ingenuity and our energy to help develop the resources of all Vietnam and repair the devastation wrought by the war. After the president had made that speech, Yu Thant communicated with Ho Chi Minh and said, surely you must recognize that the, United, that the United States has no intention of leaving Vietnam until stability is assured, has no intention of leaving or being pushed out, therefore what were the options? To continue the war until the whole place is a cinder pile or to get into negotiations in an attempt to see how it could be stopped. And he offered Rangoon as a possible site for negotiations and received from Ho Chi Minh an acceptance of Yu Thant's request to him, Ho Chi Minh, to consider favorably President Johnson's offer. When the reply came from Ho Chi Minh, Yu Thant conveyed to Ambassador Stevenson the good news that the President's offer to negotiate had been accepted. Mr. Stevenson went to, went to Washington, and ten days later, Yu Thant still hadn't received word. Week after week, month after month, Yu Thant pressed Ambassador Stevenson for official word from the United States. There was the opportunity to negotiate. He could not keep the offer open indefinitely. Finally, after four and a half months, he went to see Ambassador Stevenson again. And surely, he said, you must understand that I conveyed the President's request for negotiations in good faith. We have the, the response. They are willing to meet with us in Rangoon. I must give them an answer. Stevenson said he would go back to Washington again, which he did, had done repeatedly, and came back and said, the State Department is reluctant to negotiate because it fears there will be another collapse of the South Vietnam government. Yu Thon said, he was aware that this might be so. He said there have been six collapses in recent months. It is quite possible that there may be a seventh, with or without respect to negotiations. As for that, no one can say. But if the main purpose is to end the war and create stability, and if the only way we can do this is by getting into negotiations, then this would seem to be the first order of business. And Stevenson could only say that he had conveyed a report of the situation as he understood it. Youth on, as I said, re relayed or rather retailed this account to the president when the president came to see him in 1966. The president listened and then said, I knew nothing about this. Did you know about it, Dean? And Dean Rusk indicated that, that the situation was actually that Ambassador Stevenson had no authority to reject the negotiations. He didn't say that Ambassador Stevenson had the authority to accept them, however. And Goldberg could only say that the incident took place before his time. Now these, as I say, are just a few incidents which culminate in a report that was received or re was published last week in the Wall Street Journal that the administration now has acknowledged 
that the feelers that have been come that have come from North Vietnam are genuine, but that the administration is reluctant now to negotiate because it interprets North Vietnam's willingness to talk as proof of the fact that North Vietnam is weak, and therefore this is the time to step up the heat of the battle. Well, obviously there are some questions. Several years ago, we didn't want to negotiate because at that time we were weak in, in Vietnam. Now, if we don't want to negotiate because Vietnam, North Vietnam is weak, when will there be a time to negotiate? How many more lives have to be taken? What is the enterprise all about? How can the war end? And so I say, if the report today is true, I rejoice. I rejoice with you. But I must say that it becomes necessary for the American people to let it be known to the President of the United States that the American people believe that the only way the war can be ended, the only way the war has to be ended, is on the basis of negotiations. The pressure on the president is very substantial. Most of it, I believe, comes from those who believe it is possible to win, those who have demonstrated that just the escalation of force will not end the war, and yet they want to escalate and escalate and escalate. Most of the pressure, I believe, on the president comes from that side. And I believe the president is somewhat baffled when he reads that he's criticized for not pursuing peace measures when he feels actually that he is holding the line. Now, if we accept what the, that, that when the president told you thought that he knew nothing about the incident in 1964 and 65, if he was telling the truth, then who is not reporting to the president, indeed, who is running the war? Who made the decision to bomb Hanoi as soon as it appeared that it might be possible to end the war? Now, these are serious questions for the American people to contemplate. The closer one gets to government, the greater is the awareness that The position of the presidency, powerful though it is, is actually a point against which maximum pressure is exerted. There are, are five foreign policy centers in government today. Under our Constitution, two were provided for, the Department of State and the presidency, with the president in effect being the chief executive, and therefore the one who makes foreign policy. But now we have a center in the White House, had been headed by McGeorge Bundy and now by Walt Rostow. The State Department is a foreign policy center. The Pentagon has its own foreign policy center, where they make assessments, appraisals, recommendations, And the CIA is a center of foreign policy in the United States. Decision-making is no longer limited to the presidency. Who made the decision to bomb Hanoi after the president of the United States, through his representative, had sent assurance that the United States was sincerely interested in bringing about negotiations? Now, these are disturbing questions. Changes have come about. And these changes have been directly proportionate to the growth of military power, not just here, but throughout the world. Directly proportionate, I believe, to the fact that we are in the middle of an atomic armament race. Now, it becomes important, it seems to me, for the American people to recognize where we stand historically. The world that existed in 50 years ago in terms of the calculus of power and the logarithms of power and the locus of power, that world no longer exists. 
Power has a way of collecting its own decision-making agencies and operations. When atomic energy was utilized for weapons, we had something new in human history, which is the potentiality for creating nationwide shattering weapons. Now, this kind of power cannot be measured in ordinary terms, and yet one has the impression that atomic energy or atomic weapons are recognized or regarded as super weapons, rather than as the as a definition of something essentially new in human history, which affects every aspect of human affairs. And to me, one of the most dangerous things that has happened in the United States since 1945 is that the American people have adjusted themselves to the fact of nuclear weapons. Indeed, a large part of the human race has adjusted itself to the fact of nuclear weapons. We adjust ourselves to things we have no business adjusting to. And because we make the adjustment easily, the, the nature of and the implications of this kind of power tend to diminish and fall away from us. I think of a, an experience I had in flying across the Pacific some years ago. It was in a DC-7. A DC-7, I might explain, was a propeller plane. For the benefit of those of you who may not have heard of a propeller plane, let me explain. It was a rather implausible affair. You had these fan-like objects or devices on the front of the wings, and they turned at a very rapid rate, and this would cause the air at the, on the top of the plane to flow over at a different rate from the air on the bottom of the wing, and the plane would rise to fill that a particular vacuum. Well, it was in one such contrivance that I flew across the Pacific some years ago. And uh, about halfway across the Pacific, one of these fans stopped. And uh, the fact that it was still was, of course, apparent to some of the passengers. And there were cries of alarm. And before, uh, in, in a matter of uh, just minutes, everyone on that plane knew that one of the engines had stopped. We were all aware of the fact that just a week previously, a plane had gone down in the Pacific when there had been uh, a motor failure, and so we were all rather apprehensive. The pilot came on the intercom. Folks, he said, the number four engine prop has been feathered <coughs> We've had an engine failure, uh, but uh, don't be alarmed. We are turning back, even though we are within, within 15 minutes of the halfway point, so that we can, uh, because we can use that time to good advantage. I said, if his purpose was to reassure us, it may have fallen somewhat short of the mark. Five minutes later, he said, folks, if you look out underneath your wings, you will notice long white plumes. Uh, this is gasoline, which we are ditching in order to maintain altitude. You'll be interested to know, he continued, that we are going to ditch more gasoline in the next five minutes than you can use in your car in 65 years. Having given us that rather impressive statistic, he turned off the intercom. And once again, we all sat on the edge of our seats. But within an hour, something interesting happened. One of the passengers had a five-pound box of chocolates, and uh, he gave it to the stewardess to pass out. Uh, the plane was maintaining its altitude. Uh, there was no turbulence. Uh, no, and no one could tell the difference except for the fact of that stilled prop. But then we began to adjust to a new level of reality. The crisis had stopped snapping. We had the apparent evidence of security. Some passengers began to doze again. All of them sat back in their seats. Some read and some uh, played cards. We had adjusted. 
Well, in our world, two engines, possibly three, have gone out. An atomic race has started all over the world. Small wars are in progress. And men are talking about larger ones. As I say, two of the engines have gone out and we, we have adjusted. We accept things because we think that, well, somehow we'll manage to get through. The mark of sanity, I believe, or the mark of a civilized man, an educated man, is his ability to see the connection between cause and effect. The causes are there. The perception of the connection between cause and effect is not quite there. Now, I'd like, if I may, to touch upon some of the aspects of, of this particular crisis in which we find ourselves. And I might add that I don't think that there has been a more precarious moment in human history than the one that confronts us. The United States and the Soviet Union now have between them more than 30,000 pounds of destructive power for every man, woman, and child in the world. In our arsenals, in our stockpiles, and in the stockpiles of the Soviet Union, to say nothing of the stockpiles of France, Great Britain, and Communist China, there is enough destructive force to represent the equivalent of 30,000 pounds of TNT for every man, woman, and child in the world. Now, we don't have 30,000 pounds of food for every man, woman, and child in the world. We don't have 30,000 pounds of medicine for every man, woman, and child in the world. We don't have 30,000 pounds of textbooks or clothes or any of the things that dignify life for every man, woman, and child in the world, but we have accumulated 30,000 pounds of, of destructive force for every man, woman, and child in the world. The things that man makes reflect his values. These are the things we have adjusted to. Next. We have adjusted to the fact that even as we go up in the order of power in the world, we have gone down in the, in the order of control. Again, what is the mark of a rational man? The mark of a rational man is someone whose power and control are in balance. But as the world has gone up in the order of power, it has actually gone down in the order of control. Suppose the president, the vice president, and everyone in the line of succession, 16, 20, 64 places down, were to be killed in the first wave of a surprise atomic attack. Quite conceivable. Well, because of that possibility, we have gone down, down, down to make sure that there would always be someone left to press the retaliatory button. How many people have access to the button? We say that it's well controlled, that an accident is impossible. Only a few days ago, an accident occurred over Greenland, and today, men in thermal suits with flashlights and radioactive, or rather Geiger counters to test radioactivity, are staggering around the ice in the northern part of the world looking for four missing hydrogen bombs. Just as last year, they had to go probing over the Spanish countryside near Palomares to look for missing hydrogen bombs because of a crash in the air. If there is a possibility of an accident, we have to take into account the fact that an accident can happen. Now, we have in the air around the clock planes, 
carrying hydrogen bombs. Not far from any possible target, any conceivable target. Every one of those men, every captain of those planes is in a position by himself to make a mistake. We say that it is impossible, but we see that accidents have happened. It takes only one. At the same time, there are snorkel-type submarines off the east and west coast of the United States, Russian submarines. These submarines have launching platforms for intermediate missiles. Every city in the United States is within range. Besides, it is quite possible that the east and west coasts of the United States have been seeded, the waters have been seeded with hydrogen bombs, so that in the event of war, a tidal wave, tidal wave can be produced in both, con both coasts that can wash inland for many miles, with radioactive spray filling the air for hundreds of miles. Now what about the submarine commanders who have access to these bombs, to the launching platforms on their decks. Well, we can be sure that both in the United States and the Soviet Union, that every known test for picking responsible men who would fly in those planes and man those submarines, every known test has been employed. But I think it is also quite possible that very few psychologists would be willing to testify that the actions of such men under all circumstances are completely predictable. No human mind is predictable. This is what the uniqueness of human intelligence is all about. Some years ago, a French pilot in a bombing plane, quite otherwise quite rational, took it upon himself to drop a bomb on an Algerian village. He did so, he later said, because of the highest impulses of patriotism. He felt that the men in Paris were pusillanimous, that they could not be trusted to uphold the honor of France and that there's only one language that those people understood and that was the language of force and that was why he dropped the bomb, for the glory of France. Well, suppose he had had an atomic bomb in his plane. There are a lot of planes flying around with atomic bombs. Are we to say that because he had that much more power at his disposal, he would have been that much more restrained? It's quite possible. But it's also possible that with additional power at his disposal, he might have selected a larger target. It's not the size of the bomb, but the size of a man's ideas that determines what will happen to human history. Now, meanwhile, in three or four years, some eight or ten other countries will develop nuclear weapons. One of them will be Egypt. Another one will be Israel. Is anyone prepared to say that at the point of defeat, NASA would not have used the atomic bomb against Israel? Is anyone prepared to say that Israel, at the point of being obliterated, would not have used the atomic bomb against NASA? How much time do we have left? Because when one or two bombs go off, they can set off many others. And this is the nature of the world we live in, which is that we are interrelated in every respect except the important ones. The world interacts on the level of destruction. Then we suddenly discover we're all tied together indissolubly. But on the level of peacemaking, on the level of a rational response to human needs, there is diffusion, decentralization, 
fragmentation, compartmentalization, and idiocy. The one organization that could do something about it is the United Nations. Indeed, the United Nations, weak though it is, may well have represented the difference between war and peace, certainly as it concerns the Congo, Korea, and the Arab-Israeli Arab -Israeli crisis. But the curious thing is that the nations went to the UN after the damage was done. Not while the damage was being built up. Not while the danger was being built up. And the curious thing is that the very nations which have blocked the development of the UN, blocked giving the United Nations effective authority, are the ones that seem most eager to get the help of the UN when they need it. In 1955, a resolution came before the United Nations for reconsidering the structure of the United Nations, for giving it effective powers, for changing the voting system in the General Assembly, for making the Security Council something that could function, in short, to replace the veto with specific mechanisms of world law. The Soviet Union held back, the United States held back. The United States proposed the veto at San Francisco. And despite everything we have said about the veto since, the United States has yet to come before the UN and propose a modification of veto powers. The United States has yet proposed making the Security Council work, giving it what it needs. Dean Acheson, when he was Secretary of State, downgraded the United Nations, and only the other day uh, he spoke very disparagingly of the UN and said we must keep it weak. Well, now the United States has the ship in custody. The United States goes before the UN, before the Security Council, and says this chamber must act. The purpose of the United Nations is to keep the peace, we say. We want the United Nations Security Council to take action, to get that ship returned. And very suddenly we discover the existence of the UN. And we talk about an authority in the UN that does not exist because we and others prevented it from existing. How, how long must this continue before we learn? Now one thing is clear. The world, whether we like it or not, has developed world problems. War is now, for the first time in history, a world problem. There's only a single geographic arena. When you can fly around the world in 90 minutes or less, you have a single battlefield. The Soviet Union has the capability today of orbiting the Earth with a nuclear gun mount. We have topped the Soviet Union on that because we have the kind of spaceship which can drop nuclear bombs by, like calling cards in various parts of the world and keep on going. So as I say, the world has now become a, a single potential battlefield. There are now world problems. War is a world problem. Food is today a world problem. There is not enough food to prevent famine and the trouble caused by famine or revolution. There could be if the world would act, but there is not. Environment poisoning is a world problem. Air pollution is not a problem peculiar to Muncie, Indiana, or New York City. It's a worldwide problem. The air with its poisons is now circling the world. In order to deal with it ad adequately, you need a world response. And so man is now discovering, as he's discovered many times in the past, that he has a potential community in terms of its problems. We don't have a community today in terms of cultural affinity, in terms of political affinity, in terms of ideological affinity, but we do have a single community today geographically and a single community today in terms of the specific problems with respect, I repeat, to war, 
to famine, and to a safe environment. But where is the world response? How can we call ourselves educated or civilized unless we can meet a problem where the problem lives? And this is the challenge for our generation, which is to develop a world response to world problems. But meanwhile, each nation puts the fact of absolute national sovereignty ahead of the national interest. We decide to roll our own in Vietnam and do everything that we believe is essential for our security until such time as we feel the pinch, as in the case of the Pueblo. The same thing is true of the Russians. The Russians, indeed, in Berlin have tried to maintain an absurd situation of division. But these, again, represent aspects of a world problem that cannot be solved without a world response. What does the world response mean? It means that we have to create a mechanism to deal with world problems where the world problems live. The United Nations is, is the only chance we've got. But the United Nations, as presently constituted, lacks that authority as we are witnessing with respect to the Pueblo. It can't function in the Security Council because of a, of a veto. To expect unanimous agreement when one of the members may be a lawbreaker is to expect the impossible. Does anyone suppose that peace will always be challenged by non-security council members? Therefore, it, it is self-evident that since a lawbreaker could be a member of the Security Council, he can use his presence in the Security Council to block action against himself. Well, because the Security Council has not been workable in that respect, there has been a gravitational shift to the General Assembly. But here you have an interesting situation represented by one nation, one vote. Symbolically, it's magnificent. Symbolically, it means that a nation with, with one million population has the same voice as a nation with 200 million population. Practically, however, it is somewhat less than magnificent because it means that 10 nations with a combined population of 20 or 30 million could outvote a nation with 200 million population. Consequently, the large nations of the world are not going to agree to any essential transfer of power to the General Assembly so long as there is the one nation, one vote method of representation. Now, under these circumstances, what has happened is that the Secretariat has had the responsibility for taking initiatives without law, without without specific charter authorization, and without mechanism. In short, we live today in a world of anarchy. And anyone who supports it is an anarchist. The fact that there is not anarchy inside this community or inside the nation is only an illusion or a delusion. We are all living in the middle of anarchy. And if we put up with it, perforce, we are anarchists. Not philosophical anarchists like Kropotkin, but crude anarchists who are willing to condone a lawless state. Freedom cannot survive in a condition of anarchy. War is inevitable in a condition of anarchy. This is what anarchy is all about. Violence is the product of anarchy. That is the definition of anarchy. Now, until therefore we move rationally to create a system of law of the whole, to define the obligations of nations, to limit the power of nations, and also to deal effectively with the causes of war, we will live in this condition of anarchy, and I'm afraid we will die as anarchists. And the civilization will have its epitaph. Here was once a civilization that became an incredible anarchy. How do we begin? We begin where we are. The only thing greater, I believe, than the power of raw force is the power of ideas. It becomes necessary, it seems to me, in our time to redefine the rights of man. 
Man's natural rights begin with the obligation of the nation to provide protection. No nation anywhere in the world today can provide protection for its citizens. This is the particular ingredient, the identifying ingredient of contemporary civilization. No nation is any longer able to perform its historic function. But I believe that man has a natural right neither to kill nor be killed. And in order to live in this state, it becomes necessary to create the agencies that can protect him, that can create a situation in which it is ne not necessary either to kill or be killed. It cannot be done without law. And so the challenge to our generation is to create a situation of world law. Those who believe that it is too difficult can retire to their playthings and their, di and their diversions because it will take a great deal of energy if it is to be done. Those, on the other hand, who with a sense of history and a sense of belief in the importance of life with respect for the fragility of life and the beauty of life and the possibilities of life will recognize that nothing is more important and that if we do nothing else in our time than to devote ourselves to this essential enterprise, we will not have misused our energies. We use those energies best, it seems to me, by making known what we believe. This is the nature of a free society. Every great change in human history has come about because men have believed that change was essential and have spoken to that change. When enough men speak to the need for change, to the need for a world organization with effective powers to enforce, enact, and interpret world law, then I think the change will come about, but not before. As I say, the human race can now be divided. The anarchists and the defeatists can go to one side of the room. They're not contributing anything except a demonstration of colossal waste of the human potential and human ability. On the other side are those who are not anarchists, who have faith, who believe that any problem that man can define, he, he can solve. This again may be a definition of human uniqueness. You see, we're not called upon in the world today to do the impossible. We're not called upon to raise the plains or level the mountains or scoop out the seas. We're called upon to make decisions. We're called upon to decide what kind of a world it is we want. What kind of a world it is that we commit ourselves to? What kind of a world it is that we wish to work for? In short, what it is that we wish to do with our lives in behalf of all life? I believe that this is within the reach of man. War is an invention of the human mind. The human mind can invent peace. Thank you. Mr. Cousins, for me to say that was a thought-provoking speech, and we thank you, may sound trite, but believe me, I'm sincere, and for your address was just that type of an address, and I think the applause of the audience shows that they share that belief. A talk of your type naturally invites questions and answers. And even though the hour is late, we'll hold them to three or four. Mr. Cousins has graciously agreed to answer a few. So who would like to start out? Yes, sir. I beg your pardon, sir. Can you repeat the question? Uh, 
I'll have to talk about the specific, specific instances. The January 4th message from India, uh, has been documented, I believe, in the Saturday Review. At first, I, when I was called by the White House about that after having published the statement, I was told that no such message existed. I was asked to come down to Washington to discuss the matter, and when I got there to develop it, such a message did exist. I saw it myself. The State Department or the government said that it did pursue the matter in good faith, but as I said to you, uh, we asked for clarification. Uh, here you have a matter of reasonable judgment. When you make a proposal to someone and say to him, what are you prepared to do? And he says to you, I'm prepared. If you stop the bombing, I'm prepared to have a ceasefire altogether, beginning with the Buddhist holiday of Tet. If you really mean it, I would suppose you would say, thank you very much. We will test it. We will stop the bombing. And we'll, we will maintain a ceasefire until such time as there may be violations on the other side. We will be, not be the first to resume. Instead of which, we ask for clarification. It may be said that this was a reasonable exercise and prudent. If so, uh, one is, I suppose, justified in holding to that view. The incident with respect to the uh, Polish-American exchange that began in Saigon on November the 14th and 15th uh, was uh, reported in bits and pieces in the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times. The incident with respect to The conversation. If you stop the bombing, I'm prepared to have a ceasefire altogether, beginning with the Buddhist holiday of Tet. If you really mean it, I would suppose you would say thank you very much. We will test it. We will stop the bombing, and we'll, we will maintain a ceasefire until such time as there may be violations on the other side. We will be, not be the first to resume. Instead of which, we ask for clarification. It may be said that this was a reasonable exercise and prudent. If so. Uh, one is, I suppose, justified in holding to that view. The incident with respect to the uh, Polish-American exchange that began in Saigon on November the 14th and 15th uh, was uh, reported in bits and pieces in the Washington Post and the Los Angeles Times. The incident with respect to the conversation that took place at the headquarters of the United Nations, there were about eight people in the room at the time, when this exchange took place between you, thought and the President, was reported to me by one of the eight. The incident that took place in January 1966 I know about it firsthand because I was involved in that myself. Is there any other specific incident, sir, that you'd like to know about? Now, in fairness to the government, let this be said, that the government considers that none of these things that I've spoken of, or, or possibilities, actually carried sufficient substance. The government contends that the reason that it did not proceed during the time when Yusant got the reply from Hanoi about negotiations in Rangoon, the government contends that at that time it was engaged in delicate discussions with Canada about the possibility of negotiations and therefore it didn't want to confuse the issue. Uh, again, one might say that this is a reasonable explanation, although one might suppose that Yusant, having been in direct communication with Ho Chi Minh, uh, might uh, appear to be uh, uh, to represent an opportunity that should not be be treated with, in comparative terms with with Canada, but that that again is a matter of interpretation. The government contends, with respect to the January fourth episode, that we were exercising. I, th I think I said this due diligence. Gen the government contends that the incident with respect to uh, the meeting that would have taken place in Warsaw on January the 13th 
1966, following the, during the pause, uh, I think I said before, did not represent a sufficiently high level of response, and that it came at a time during the pause, and that therefore it didn't feel the present ought to be vibrated. Now, I will not argue with anyone who, on the basis of the interpretations of these incidents, will contend that the government acted prudently. All I ask is that it be recognized that these incidents did occur. And it is not true to say that there were no opportunities to negotiate. We can say, if we wish, that we don't think that those, op that those specific opportunities were sufficiently genuine to warrant uh, even the preliminary discussion, that's, that's something else. We can quarrel with that. But I don't think it can be said that there were no specific opportunities. There were. Next. A great deal has been said about the fact that South Vietnam has not wished to negotiate. That may or may not be true. We have, uh, uh, all I can do is report to you. But it is also a fact that, North Viet that South Vietnam has not been too eager to negotiate either, as we have, as we have seen. So as I say, we have not been getting, I feel, enough of the kind of information that the people in the free society need in order to make up their minds. This is the main, the main thrust of what I've been talking about. Now, I may be wrong in some of the specific dates, perhaps, uh, or, uh, uh, or sequences that I've related to you. There may be other things bearing on those specific inc incidents that would reduce the validity of what I'm saying. They may reduce the validity, but they do not eliminate a possible validity. This I ask you to consider. Please. Yes, sir. Did you all hear the question? Did you all hear the question back there? It was very well phrased. It said, how do we appraise the attempt of Senator McCarthy, Eugene McCarthy, to act on the will for peace, as he understands it, uh, of the American people, and how much progress is he making? I don't know whether I paraphrased your question correctly. Please uh, give me the nuance if I didn't didn't get it. Uh, I have no way of estimating Senator McCarthy's effectiveness any more than you have. I haven't uh, been on the trail. I haven't uh, been in a position to pick up the spore and uh, uh, see what has happened. Uh, so all I can do uh, is what you have done, which is to read the newspapers and try to guess. Yes, sir. The question concerns a possible analogy between what is happening now and Munich. Is it possible that we could have, as a result of uh, appeasement or false peace in Vietnam, the kind of experience that we had after Munich when Hitler uh, regarded Munich as an invitation to yet another predatory attack, meaning that ultimately we were faced with a much more difficult situation than we could have faced at Munich. Is there a time, I am asked, when force is justified? I don't know whether I paraphrased your question correctly. Sir, I don't believe in peace at any price. If I felt that the world's peace can only be preserved by spending the rest of my life on my knees, 
I would be against that kind of peace. I don't want anyone to have to spend his life on his knees. But if genuine peace is possible, and if it is true that we now have to find some way other than force to deal with force because of the nature of, of force, then we have something essentially new in the world today that did not exist at the time of Munich. We also have a lot of other history behind us that we can put to work to in addition to Munich, which shows that it is possible by extending the process of a collective consensus to enlarge the reality of community. Now, fortunately, we are not faced with precisely the kind of situation we did then, although some men may analogize it to be such. And it may well be, no one knows, that we have an opening that may not have existed at that time. But the only way to find out if we do have such an opening is to probe for it. We now have the United Nations. If we know that we're going to have to come before the United Nations at some time and plead for United Nations action, as we are doing today in the case of the Pueblo, why shouldn't we give the United Nations the very means we say it must now employ? Our ability to advocate that kind of United Nations will, in fact, determine the wisdom of American foreign policy. I'm most grateful to you for your, for your patience, for your questions, and most of all, for your willingness to stay for the late Sir Norman. Thank you again, Mr. Cousins. We stand adjourned.